try to allow ten minutes for questions. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so basically I'm going to talk about a theory that we have been developing for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and that now is kind of uh, reaching maturity. And uh, so it started with some very uh, simplified models and now we think we can even make uh, quantitative predictions uh, for organic materials. So this is uh, more or less this, uh, what, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So there, there has been already a, a, a brief introduction on organic semiconductors by the previous speaker. Um, I'll describe a bit more uh, of the experimental situation and what are the problems, the open problems here uh, concerning the, the mobility. And then there is a, this is essentially the bulk of, the, of my talk. So uh, the, the theory uh, that I'll present is called transient localization theory, and you will understand why. So I'll start from a, a, a model study that is uh, where it all started, and uh, describe an approximation that uh, we developed uh, uh, right from the start that uh, allows you to do actual calculations at a very modest, modest uh, cost, but also gives you a lot of insight into the transport mechanism. And then I'll go to more realistic applications of the, the theory. So if time allows, I'll describe more recent uh, results that are just like three months old that kind of match this theory to uh, the more conventional Boltzmann theory of transport in uh, covalent semiconductors. And uh, so all these correspond to, so all this can be found in a, in a review that is uh, more or less recent. Uh, and all the rest is more recent work uh, that we have been doing. This is unpublished. Okay, so there has been already a, a, a short introduction on uh, organic semiconductors. Um, so what we mean by this is anything that is based on carbon. And there are many uh, examples. Uh, so the ones that are used in solid state are uh, polymers. Graphene. Graphene is a whole different animal because uh, it has so-called Dirac electrons. And so people from starting from high energy physics they became interested in, in that because it has the Dirac equation as a, uh, a low, energy, low energy theory. But we won't talk about this. Uh, what we're interested in is these uh, crystals that are made of small molecules. So this has been, uh, this was fa very famous uh, for a long time and uh, I'll tell a few words later why. Uh, this molecule here is rubrine is basically the, what all the, the, the benchmark studies uh, are about because it's the, the one that has the top mobility that you can reach and uh, it's the one where most of the experimental studies have been done. Uh, Fullerene is also famous because uh, not only for OPVs but you can dope it and make it uh, become superconducting. So uh, here's a, I'm showing this timeline just to show that uh, organic semiconductors are not new. Uh, so it's basically more than a century old. Already photoconductivity was uh, found in anthracene uh, at the beginning of 20th century. Um, I'm also showing this because I, I come from theoretical physics and uh, uh, seeing that it has some applications is kind of mysterious to me. Uh, actually, uh, there have been, so uh, this, this year, uh, they are uh, producing t uh, cell phones that have foldable screens, and these are based on organics. Uh, there is one interesting thing here that uh, compared to covalent semiconductors, you have a lot of choice. So this is the number of known uh, organic molecules that you can make crystallize. And uh, it's kind of growing exponentially. So 
it's of the order of 100 million. Uh, yeah. And so, in principle, you, can find, you could find any property that you like, but uh, the point is that you cannot just try all of them, and you need some design principle or some basic understanding of what is going on. So, uh, this is also some sketch of uh, applications that uh, I know nothing about, but I like the pictures because they kind of connect with some equations in a mysterious way. So you can do, uh, we heard it already from the previous speaker, uh, you can uh, make OLEDs, these niche OLED uh, screens. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, no. OLEDs are not niche. The photovoltaic cells are niche. Uh, field effect transistors, uh, electronic paper, sensors, uh, skin, and all kind of uh, radio frequency uh, applications. The idea here is that uh, you don't want to replace silicon industry, but uh, there are advantages in using these materials because they're flexible, they're cheap, in principle they're non-toxic, and uh, you can uh, work on them at room temperature, so you don't need to inject a lot of energy to produce your devices. Now, the, the main bottleneck here is that the charge carriers are very slow. So this is what we are working on and trying to make the carriers faster. So let's uh, go to, from fancy applications to basic science. So this is basically the problem that we have. So this arrow tells you so is, is an axis for mobility. Uh, clean silicon and Graphene are on this end here with mobilities above 1,000 or 1 million. We know how to treat them. I'll, I'll show it in the next slide. Uh, we've heard a lot about amorphous systems, and uh, we more or less know. There is some controversy, but uh, we know how to treat them by these hopping mechanisms. And organic crystals are here in between, and we don't really know what, what to use. So this. Uh, this is what I'm uh, showing here. So when you're on this side, I'm sorry, it's the other, the, the, the other way around. So when, are, when you're uh, at high mobility, and this uh, works for wideband semiconductors, you can apply semi-classical uh, Boltzmann theory. And basically, this tells you that you have waves, and uh, the scattering uh, by impurities or phonons is some rare event. And this makes the mobility very large. Um, on the other side, which is the low mobility, which is the left side, as you can see, you have a, a very long residence time. So the, 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 the carriers, they stay on molecules for a long time, and they're slowed down by some uh, local trapping modes. And then uh, the time it takes to go to hop from one uh, molecule to the next is very long, and this gives you uh, very low mobilities. And so hopping theory uh, would work for materials, say, with mobilities below 0.1 centimeters squared per volt second. Boltzmann for above 100, but we are in this regime here, and we basically don't know what to do. OK, so let's start to build a model for this and, and look at what uh, really matters. So I'll focus mostly on rubrin. Rubrin is this molecule here, so it has these four benzene rings, and then there is, there is four more uh, phenyl rings attached as wings. You can take a single molecule, and uh, so you, you can look at the molecular orbitals. So they give you energies, and then there is a number of electrons that uh, make this molecule neutral, and you fill up these levels up to the highest uh, occupied level, which is called HOMO. And then the lowest unoccupied level is called LUMO. And they have, so they're pretty delocalized all over the molecule. Uh, now, you want to make a crystal out of it. And uh, this is the crystal structure of rubrin. This is in, a, in the high conducting plane. So it has this herringbone structure. 
And the direction of high mobility is this one. Yeah. So when you make a crystal, of course, these levels uh, will, uh, so these are the levels of an isolated molecule. And uh, if you calculate the band structure, there is some dispersion. But this dispersion is very weak. Actually, it's, it's very uh, reminiscent of the structure of the individual molecule. So the, the molecular energies are the strongest. And then uh, this dispersion is very weak. This is quite different from silicon, where you start having bands that disperse in all, uh, in all directions. So here is a summary of what is important to us. Um, there are weak overlap integrals between, between molecules. These are pi orbitals. And the uh, bands typically are around or below half an EV. Uh, they look like mole weakly distorted molecular levels. And uh, this will be uh, very important in a second. The bonding is a van der Waals. So this, the forces are, are very weak. It's not like covalent bonding. And Rubrin has a record mobility around 15, maybe 20, if you look at uh, some uh, very uh, rare uh, samples that go above the, uh, 15. But 15 is a, is a reasonable number for an average. OK, and then let, our target basically today is to try to explain the mobility of Rubrin. So what experimentalists do is they make a, a, a field effect transistor. So they put rubrin on top of a dielectric, put a gate, and then a source of a drain. The gate uh, pushes charges into a conducting channel here. And then you, you, you make a current flow through from source to drain. So if you do this, and you do it at several temperatures, and uh, several different groups and several samples. This is what you find. So these are experimental points. This is temperature and this is mobility. Um, I won't bother uh, with what happens at low temperature because uh, so either the sample cracks because the expansion coefficient of this plastic here is different from the dielectric, or there is some impurity dominated transport. So I, I won't look at this. But the high temperature regime here looks pretty much similar in all devices. So there is some variation in absolute value, but uh, it looks pretty much intrinsic. And uh, what we see is that there is a power law. So this is log-log scale. So this looks like a, a power law. Uh, as I said, the room temperature here mobility is about 15. And uh, so this is our target. How can we explain this? Yeah, yeah please. OK, this is the last line, which is very interesting, large sample to sample variation. Yes. To get the mobility here, you have a model of a transistor. Yes. Which has many parameters. Yes. The contact resistances, the potentials, and so on. So how much of the sample to sample variations are due to the material, connecting material, and how much is due to variations of the structure? Uh, well, I don't know, but uh, I mean, this. Okay. this the contact resistance is taken out systematically. That's, the channel is quite long, so that's not a problem. Thickness dependence and then contact is not. OK. So also, uh, this is mirrored with time of night support, and it gives the same number of time. OK, so who's the. I'm always a bit suspicious when I see a power law over dynamics of a factor of two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'll tell you that power laws come from theory, so okay. <laughs> I'm also suspicious. Okay. <laughs> this would make it even more, even more suspicious. Okay, uh, I won't go into the details of this, but. Uh, the, the basic problem in these materials is that there is contradictory, uh, contradictory information from experiments. Some experiments tell you that you have block waves, and some experiments tell you that you have localized particles. And uh, so in particular, uh, you see bands in photoemission, and uh, you can see a whole effect. Uh, Seebeck effect will tell you that it's compatible with band-like carriers. 
But still, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, these uh, tales of the density of states uh, in uh, the previous talks. And uh, there are tales that are intrinsic here and that are about 20 millieV. So this is of the order of temperature, and you cannot neglect them. And uh, this, is, uh, I'll, this is a smoking gun of something that is wrong in these materials, is that you measure the optical conductivity and it doesn't look like a drew the peak. It has a, a, a peak at finite frequency. Finite frequency, you can transform this into finite radius. And uh, this radius is telling you directly about localization. So what is optical conductivity? Well, it's optical absorption. You, you, okay. you charge the conducting channel, and then you look at how these carriers absorb light. OK. So in a normal. No, no, it's a question. Yeah. OK, so if you have seen here, the last point here is something that uh, uh, is very specific to organics, is that because the forces are very weak and uh, you're at room temperature, it's a, high temper it's a high energy scale compared to all others, then uh, your lattice has very uh, strong fluctuations. So the molecules are moving a lot. And, uh, this you can measure, actually. So, actually, so this was measured in Cambridge. Uh, you can do electron diffraction, and uh, you measure these, these streaks here in, in your signal. And from this, you can extract, uh, you cannot see well here, but this is the fluctuation, spatial fluctuation in angstroms of molecules uh, along the longitudinal direction versus temperature. So from just equipartition principle, you expect this to scale like square root of temperature. This is OK. But uh, the surprising thing here is that this is so large. So 0.1 angstrom doesn't look like what you have in covalent, uh, covalent uh, semiconductors. So this is very large. Now there is a second point that is very important, and we have seen it already, is that now these are two molecules that are uh, neighboring. And if you imagine that they're sliding uh, in, and rotating in all possible ways, you can estimate how the transfer integrals depend on uh, these coordinates. So this is the longitudinal coordinate. And you see that, uh, imagine you start from here. So point 0.1 uh, angstrom would correspond to probably 20 millieV variation. And the 20 millieV variation over 100 is a huge variation. So this can be made more quantitative. So if you, you, can, do, you can run a molecular dynamic simulation at room temperature or at different temperatures, and then plot the distribution of probability of these uh, transfer integrals. And you see, instead of having a, a very sharp defined value, you have a whole very broad distribution. Actually, the, the, the spread of this is comparable with the, with the mean value. So this is the, the, the crucial point here. And you can try to do standard electron phonon coupling approaches, but uh, maybe it's better to change your point of view altogether and see this as this thing here as some very slowly varying Gaussian disorder, and then see what happens. So it's still phonons, but it's just the, a change of language. And uh, so here I come to uh, uh, the theory. So it all started uh, in, in 2006 uh, when uh, uh, this guy here, uh, Torisi, uh, decided to study this model numerically. I'll show the simulation in a, in a second. Um, you take a stack of molecules and you allow them to fluctuate up and down and you modulate their transfer integrals linearly. So U is the coordinate of the molecule and uh, the transfer will, will vary uh, this way because this, these, uh, these variables here are the molecular um, coordinates, they are classical. These are very heavy degrees of freedom. This is a Gaussian, and then linear, uh, a linear transformation of a Gaussian is still a Gaussian. So you have Gaussian fluctuations of your transfer integral. 
So this is the Hamiltonian here. Um, of course, you can decorate this with all, all sorts of microscopic details, but uh, this, let, let's focus on this first. And the first thing you can try to do is, OK, I, I really, what I know is this semi-classical theory. Let's try to apply it. So you want to express the mobility as some, uh, in terms of some uh, scattering time and some effective mass. Now, if you do this, when you calculate your, your scattering time, uh, for that model, it's quite simple. You can get analytical expressions. And then you can plug them into this formula. And you indeed get a power law. So you're happy. Uh, and maybe uh, you can conclude that you have explained everything. But uh, the problem is that if you really try to believe these numbers, uh, you have a contradiction. And it's the following is that the mean free path that you extract from the previous expression is shorter than the distance between molecules. So you're, you're building waves in a periodic lattice of spacing uh, A. And so for the waves to exist, they have to, be, to have a, a, a wavelength, a, 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 the, the packet has to be defined for longer than the distance between the molecules. And what you find is that experimentally, this number here is shorter. So you can put numbers here and define a, a, a critical mobility below which the Boltzmann theory breaks down. And uh, if you put numbers, you get 23 at room temperature. And as I said, rubrin is the best, and it's 15. So all other materials will be even below that. So you are not allowed uh, to, to use Boltzmann theory. So this is plotted here. So these are, again, these measurements. This now is the motyoff Regel limit, which is where the mean free path becomes smaller than the lattice spacing. And uh, you are below here. So what can we do? So it all started with this numerical study. Uh, and um, the thing is that you can simulate your Schrodinger equation. But instead of keeping the molecules frozen, you make them oscillate as classical oscillators. And uh, so you, this is the degree of freedom of the molecule. And uh, the electrons will have a back action on the molecular degrees of freedom. And it's this uh, average force here. So there is something that we, we, we know already what, what will happen. Imagine you freeze your molecules. So this is a sketch in 1D. So all these coordinates here are the molecular coordinates. And you start with the wave function of a carrier localized at some point in the sample. And then you run the simulation. It starts spreading. But then, because it's a localized system, uh, it cannot spread forever. And this will give you a vanishing mobility. And in particular, the spread of this, you can either calculate with the inverse particip participation ratio or look at the wave function. It gives you a measure of localization, localization length. Now what happens when you let the molecules move is that at the beginning, the dynamics is similar. You still see this kind of length scale here for some time. And then at longer times, it spreads. So the system knows about this localization length, but uh, it will diffuse. So if you wait forever, this wave function will spread all over uh, the system, and it will spread like the square root of time, which is diffusion. So this is a cartoon of what is going on. So imagine you have a landscape of this order, and you put, uh, you calculate the eigenstates here. You will find that they're localized. We have seen this uh, yesterday and today also. Now, the point is that the, the phenomena that lead to this localization, they're quantum, and they're destroyed if you make this potential, if you shake this potential. So if you, if you add a, a time dependent to this disorder, then you will allow uh, 
a motion of these uh, states here. And the motion will be driven by the time scale of the, of the disorder. So this is a cartoon. And what we want is to make a theory that uh, essentially describes, uh, gives a formal basis to that cartoon. Uh, so what we do is uh, we use Kubo formalism. <coughs> And we know that uh, localization properties are uh, embodied in the correlation function of the velocity. And I'll describe to you in the next slide how we build a theory that connects the uh, real system with dynamics of molecules to this localized system that uh, uh, is much easier to, to, to calculate. So. <laughs> Our basic object is this thing here. So this is the, the x, x is the position of the electrons. So this is the spread of uh, the electron position operator over time t. If you take a derivative of this, you get the instantaneous diffusivity. And if you take a second derivative, uh, it's quite easy to see that you derive this once, it gives you velocity, but there is a square, and then you derive a second time and you get this anti-commutator of the velocities. So this quantity here, this commutator, anti-commutator of the velocities, this correlation function, is the second derivative of the spread. You can see this here. So now, we know how the velocity correlations decay in the case of diffusion. You start from some value, and then because there is scattering, uh, after some scattering time, you will lose track of your original uh, velocities. OK, now I'm going to play this game because everyone is playing it. <laughs> so does anyone have an idea of what this will look like when you have localization? Static? Or a static. Okay. Uh, one. Huh? So look here. Localization means that the diffusion constant is 0 at long time. So the integral from 0 to infinity, which is long time, of this thing must be 0. So if it starts positive, it must become negative at some point. And actually, you have this equal area rule. So the total area of the positive is equal to the area of the negative. And this is what constrains the diffusivity to be 0. So the, the, the trick now is that we want to, dis, to, to break this symmetry between the positive area and uh, a negative area. And to do this, uh, we just introduce this unbalance here. And this is a decay of the localization uh, corrections. So you see that if you do this, this part will be reduced more than this part. Because at short times, this is essentially 1. And it will go to 0 at large times. So if you do, you obtain this curve here. And you, you see that there is more positive than negative, And you restore a positive uh, diffusivity. OK, so now you can play the game the other way around. So because this is uh, the second derivative, I can integrate this twice and get a, a real-time view of the diffusion. So th that's the spread of the, of the carrier wave, fun wave function uh, as a function of time. In the case of diffusion, I know that I start ballistic before I see scattering. And then at some point, the, 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 the power law will change with time. And I get this uh, diffusion, which is uh, square root of time. For a localized system, I have seen this in the simulation. It starts ballistic, but then it stops at some length. And what this approximation does is that it wants to follow uh, the localized system up to a time here that is dictated by the molecular fluctuations. And after, after this time, uh, it doesn't know that it's localized anymore. And then it starts diffusing again. So this is what this regime here, intermediate regime, is what we call transient localization. And because this is 
slowing down the, the, the carriers in this regime, you will get uh, typically a diffusivity that is below the semi-classical value. And there's another game you can play. You can demonstrate this. This relationship is exact. So if you know the time dependence of the spread, uh, you know the optical absorption. And you can also invert it and uh, just measure this thing from the optical absorption that is experimentally, experimentally measured. OK. This is the main result. Uh, if you work out the numbers, you can get a formula for the mobility that is the following. So mobility uh, has a temperature, the electronic charge. These are given. And it basically depends on these two parameters, the localization length and the time scale of the molecules. Uh, this, you can go back to a cartoon with this. Uh, this is typically, because length squared divided by time is diffusion, you can interpret this as diffusion over length L with a, an attempt time that is uh, this molecular time scale. And uh, so I said that we needed a change of paradigm, and uh, we have it because in Boltzmann theory, there are two parameters that are important. is the effective mass and the scattering rate. So we have changed to, to two different parameters, which are this localization length and, and tau in. So now we have a handle uh, on what we, where we can act uh, if we want to modify the mobility or improve it, hopefully. So, uh, well, first of all, this is the result that you get uh, if you apply the theory to, to Rubrin, so you calculate ab initio all the parameters of the model and, uh, and then you, you apply the theory and it gives you an upper bound uh, to the, the mobility. It has the, uh, the proper or some uh, power low temperature dependence and it's compatible with now with short mean free paths. Okay. Well, the, the phonon here only enters as, as this time. Well, it also enters in the amount of molecular disorder that the, electron, the carriers are feeling. So the more... Did you have to run the MD simulations to... Uh, so there, there are two ways to do it. Uh, I'll show a kind of... Uh, I'll show it in a, in, in a second. OK, it's actually here. <laughs> so how do you do this? Uh, first, you have to calculate the fluctuations of these transfer integrals and possibly also the, the molecular site energies. You can either do molecular dynamics or do some DFT and uh, displace your phonons and, and, uh, and get all the couplings. Once you have this, uh, you define a, some frozen disorder. And you solve for your electrons in, this, in the presence of this frozen disorder. And this, you also have two methods. One is really implementing a real-time evolution of the spread, or you can do exact diagonalization. So both methods have uh, pros and cons. For the ED, we have now an open access code that you can use and calculate all that you need. And then you apply this formula. And now you can calculate your mobility, optical conductivity, and uh, whatever you want. OK, so this is the bulk of the theory. If you have questions, uh, I'm going to move to something. Maybe, can you repeat the physical meaning of tau in that goes in your response? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, you'll see it here. So in this second simulation here, at this time here, you see that the spread starts uh, increasing again. This is the frequency. So the, this, this time is the inverse of the frequency of the molecules. Because if you're at, if you're at a short, shorter time, the molecules don't move. They, they are so slow that the electron sees them as a static disorder. But if the electron is faster at longer time, 
uh, it sees, it realizes that the molecules are oscillating. Yeah. If you look at the diffusion, uh, so the plot where you have ballistic regime and then uh, you went to uh, the diffusion. Uh, yeah. So you say that it doesn't really go to diffusion, it just goes to. Oh, it goes to diffusion. It goes to diffusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tau e is the. Molecular crossover, time scale. Crossover between the. Localization and diffusion. Yes. And tau B is? Uh, that's uh, the beginning of localization, the onset of localization. Uh, this is just, forget about it. I mean, but you see that, imagine you take this uh, time to infinity, which means frozen disorder. <coughs> then this will go down here and will stay localized forever. For the simulation, the dynamic of the uh, molecule, you know, in um, using a finite temperature? Yes. And how, what kind of thermostat are you using? So, uh, you don't need a thermostat because it's a, the molecules are frozen. So, it, they don't inject energy into the system. So, it's just a disordered system with electrons at a given temperature. Well, there is no dissipation because uh, at the at the numerical at the level of the numerical simulation, all scattering is elastic. There's no exchange of energy. So the only information about temperature you have is the distribution of disorder. This is controlled by temperature, but uh, because the simulation is run on a statically disordered system, you don't need to dissipate energy. But you believe that your your time average is and your ensemble average is. Yes. I have a question. When you have the correlation function, you're multiplying by a decay, right? And it's yeah, weird. that's an ansatz. It works. Right. I mean, have you checked with like a Gaussian or something, some other decay? I mean, there's plenty of positive definite functions, right? Uh, uh, yes, it, do it doesn't work for reasons that we can discuss. You can make a distribution of exponentials. This will work. Uh, a Gaussian won't, won't work. If you have an exact solution, you can. So in principle, you can do quantum Monte Carlo and do the reverse engineering. But the data uh, are so scattered that you cannot really do it. OK, so now that we have a theory, uh, we have this question in mind. Uh, well, the, the community has this question in mind. How to improve it? And as I said, we have a formula. So this tells you immediately that what you want to increase, to increase the mobility, is this length here. There are two ways to do it. The most obvious one is to suppress this uh, molecular di disorder. And uh, we have ideas on how to do it. Uh, this is work in progress. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, what I'm going to describe next is a second route, which is instead of reducing the disorder, we want to make them less affected by disorder. Because disorder is kind of unavoidable because of these thermal fluctuations. And uh, so this is uh, done here. So there is a first observation is that except for the fullerenes, that are three-dimensional. All molecular materials have a highly conducting plane where to a good approximation, you only need to account for nearest neighbor, for these six ne nearest neighbors here. So now I'm taking molecules and <coughs> treating them as, as point-like. Um, if you, when you calculate these uh, quantities, you will realize that uh, the, this mobility depends on 10 parameters, uh, even in this simplified model, which is a lot. So there is no way you can do something systematic. But uh, you can just, you can manage to reduce this number of parameters to something reasonable. And uh, this is done as follows. The shape of the unit cell, it's three parameters. So how you squeeze this cell 
and you, you distort it. But these are kind of trivial. It, they will enter as prefactors here. So we don't consider them. There is a time, this time scale here turns out to be pretty uh, constant over all materials that we studied. And also, it doesn't affect much uh, the, the final result. Then you have the disorder. So you have three parameters that are the fluctuations of these transfer integrals. And uh, you can show that these three parameters can be combined into just one, which is the, the, the sum of the squares. <laughs> And similarly, uh, all that uh, concerns the band structure, so the, the transfer integrals themselves, you can combine as some absolute value plus you can define two angles, uh, which you can always do because now you fix this value here. This defines a sphere in three coordinates, and then you can define two, two angles. So you can map all materials onto a sphere uh, you can take this as a constant for now, and uh, already you can learn a lot. So this is what you learn. Uh, on the surface of this sphere, you can calculate the localization length. And what you realize is that there are sweet spots and uh, hot spots here. So the one-dimensional cases, for example, here you only have transfer integral along, along one direction and the others are zero. These are dark, it's strongly localized, because this is one dimensional, in 1D, localization is maximized. On the contrary, this is the perfectly isotropic regime where A, B, and C are the same, and uh, it's not a surprise that this is where the largest length is, and therefore the largest mobility. So ideally, you want to put your materials here. And uh, so now you can take, for some reason, most materials are either on this line here or very close to it, uh, which means that JB and JC are equal by symmetry. And then this is just the same plot, but versus this angle. And uh, you can actually put real data on top. So these are actual materials. And this thing here is just the value of L squared that you read here. And uh, the trends are very well described. We know why this guy is too low. Um, this is because it has a, a very strong disorder. But this has already some predictive power. So really, if you want to improve your materials, you better put them on this white uh, well, very close to this red spot here. Uh, there's something quite surprising that we realized is that, uh, contrary to what people think, the bandwidth doesn't play any role here. So this mobility doesn't depend on the absolute value of bandwidth. So there, there is no interest in really trying to in, improve the overlaps uh, in absolute value. So if you go from 50 millev to 150, you will not gain anything. The only thing that matters is the relative values of these, so isotropy. And uh, OK, these are, this is a list of materials. So there are new and new materials that uh, come out. And you can put them on, on this sphere. And uh, so you should mostly focus on these ones. OK, do I have five minutes? Yes, OK. So this is very recent work that uh, uh, we have been doing in the last few months. And uh, the question is the following. Uh, we have a theory for organic materials that uh, uh, exhibit some sort of localization. But our friends who do experiments, they are improving the materials every day. And at some point, uh, they will hopefully reduce the effects of localization. And then the materials will be maybe described by Boltzmann theory. So all this crossover regime, there is no theory for it. And uh, in, in more fundamental terms, uh, there is an issue with the theory that we have developed, is that if you remember, we started from the localized system. 
And we applied this decay of velocity correlations. But now, imagine that this time here is very short, or the characteristic times here are very long. Then what we want is to recover Boltzmann theory. So we want to recover Boltzmann theory when this order is very weak, which means very long scattering times. And this will not do for a simple reason, is that not only you kill the long time behavior, but if this tau in is very short, which is the case in, in uh, covalent semiconductor, for example, you will also kill this first descent here. So you're overcounting, you're double counting your relaxation somehow. And so uh, we came up with this idea, and uh, it's kind of shameful that it took 10 years, but uh, it's so stupid. Uh, so you, re you rewrite this thing here by summing and subtracting the Boltzmann regime, so the Boltzmann result. And then you apply relaxation only to the correction, not, not to the whole uh, correlation function. And if you do, uh, you will have a formula for, for the mobility that has both the transient localization result and Boltzmann theory. And this is just a correction term that interpolates between the two. So um, let me skip this one. So with this theory, now we can put all materials in a uh, kind of general phase diagram. Here is this angle which uh, identifies the band structure. So let me remind you that this is isotropic. This is 1D. This is also 1D. Um, this is the amount of disorder. So these points are calculated. So it's all ab initio estimates of uh, disorder and the band structure. So there is something which is striking. So there is a maximum of the band transport regime when you're isotropic. This is expected. But for some reason, materials avoid this maximum. So you either have low disorder, but very anisotropic structures, or isotropic structures and high disorder. But there is no material that can combine these two, uh, like in an optimal way, these two characteristics. And uh, so ideally, you want to look for this magic material here, the star, that combines both isotropic bands and low disorder. And uh, we predict with, uh, I think, with some decent accuracy that you could reach mobilities of the order of 50 uh, centimeters squared per volt second. So, so, so like, why isn't that you don't want to go to delta g divided by g, which is very small? Uh, these, no, you, you, can, you want to. It's just that, uh, you, you don't have, uh, well, these are all real examples. Okay. So the, you, the, the lowest in nature is 0 0.28. And it's uh, TMTES fantasy. <coughs> and rubrine is just here, so it's very close. So they are all? Well, these are close to theta zero, but they have strong disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is my summary. It's a very short summary. So <laughs> you can read it <laughs> by yourself. And these are my collaborators. Thank you for your attention. Molecular vibrations. So it's not really disorder. I call it disorder, but it's dynamic. It's really phonons, slow phonons. Mm -hmm. But I call them dynamic disorder because it's a different mindset. These are quite low frequency. Yeah, yeah typically 5 to 10 milliEV or uh, 50 wave numbers are the units that you want. Phonon vibration that. That moves the uh, molecules relative to each other? Yes. And so the band so structure. Is it due to the fact that you have only Van der Waals yes. between molecules? Yes. 
So would that change if you would replace these water transporters by uh, chemical bonds? Sure. Yeah. So is that the way to go? <laughs> well, uh, well, I, I'm currently, currently studying organic salts. So it's layers of these kinds of molecules and metallic ions. But uh, so they do layers. And you cannot get rid of the intrinsic vibrations of the molecular layer. So it, you can imagine that it blocks somehow in one direction, but in the direction of the plane, it will not do anything. So. Well, graphene is a different <laughs> object. Yes. So you have uh, shown uh, the simulations where you have sort of uh, homogeneous uh, vibrations everywhere. Yeah. And uh, in reality, don't you have like regions of high vibrations, high level of vibration, sort of making the <coughs> inhomogeneous the phonon distribution over the outer space, and uh, you have uh, that would uh, distribute like the, your toe in. It's a bit the other parameter. Yes. Yeah. You can imagine that uh, in a real system, it's uh, more, it's less homogeneous than that. I don't think it really matters at the end. I, I think I have an answer to this. So we have also worked with Alessandro, and we had three nodes in the thermostat, which was coupled to these motions. And I, only one of them is important. The which one? Okay. But in, but in my, I, maybe I can show this in material. This is the the the, the thing that uh, I mentioned about the, this uh, uh, how to reduce the fluctuation. So uh, if you take this molecule and uh, look at all the all the modes. So these are the the spreads. So these are, this is the, the mode energy. These are phonon modes. You can see the arrows, how they vibrate. And the important thing is this is how they contribute to the total disorder. And you see there is this big spike, this big initial spike. And it's always the lowest frequency phonon that contributes the most to the disorder. And then you have all the rest, like you have 300 modes here. And they only contribute maybe 20%. But 80% is just one mode. So, OK, of course, you can make it depend on uh, the position, but I, I'm not sure it will. So it's the lowest in the, in the, in it's the, it's the It's the sliding. Yeah, yeah we have a columnar system, and the goal is this one. Yeah. OK, so I have one last question. What you've shown now? On this system, you never talked about the topology of the, the network of uh, propagation. Well, that network. was a chain. That was a model okay. system. But then, okay. then we started this two-dimensional ladder. Does it matter? Does it matter? If you have a more complex topology than one. Other. Well, it will change uh, some exponents. Like temperature dependence will be different. Uh, uh, this power law will change. But uh, not the, the absolute numbers. Like Well, the, the, the numbers are here. So this is how, or you, you had it. Uh, so this is how mobility varies. So this is 1D, mm -hmm. and this is 2D. So you see that the mobility varies by okay. a factor of 6, okay. the absolute value. So you, you, that's why you better stay here, not here. So you have to increase the connectivity, which is natural. You yeah, yeah, it is. Of your system. Yeah, it's obvious. After you see the result. Yeah, after. Okay. So, yeah. so in principle, the, the shape is, uh, <coughs> would that be very similar to the band structure calculation? So I could okay, so you. Do scale to or something like this. Okay, so I, I, I've, this is the same shape. Yeah. This is a very optimal, very low disorder, okay? So it's, it's uh, this is what 
uh, transient localization would give you is this shape. The gray line is band structure. And you see that if you're isotropic and low disorder, you're very, so the red line is the truth, what we call the truth. It's, it's very close to band. But here, uh, there is a factor of two reduction if you're 1D. And, and the, so the reduction factor, if you increase disorder, this is just the actual mobility divided by the band value. And it goes steadily down with disorder. So you're off by even a factor of three if you're, if you have strong disorder. But the trends are kind of OK. <laughs> the, the, the geometric uh, picture is there. Yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. So the band, of course, it depends on the band yeah. structure. Then the band so theory. The ideas, yeah. The I think we have uh, 15 minutes of poster to which you can add some coffee. Yes, uh, we'll start with